All right. Now it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Colonel Sean Morrow. He's a West Point graduate with a distinguished military career, including deployments in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Korea. He was involved in trilateral talks between North and South Korea, representing the United Nations Command. Furthermore, he acted as an assistant professor at West Point, holds an advanced degree in political science and Irish studies. Currently, he is a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago Irish Studies. That's interesting. Talk about that. Top of the morning to you. The floor is yours. Good morning and thank you for having me today. This is my first time to Israel and I promise that I don't think it will be the last. First, I bring condolences from West Point on the passing of Shabtai Shavit. We are all lucky that such leaders lived and may we be inspired by his example of a life lived in service to his country and to his fellow citizens. Professor Reichman, Professor Gnor, thank you not only for including the Combating Terrorism Center in this incredible conference, but for the continuous and growing partnership we have achieved together. When I took this job, your welcome was meaningful, but your drive to expand our partnership was even more meaningful. Colonel Eisen, I'm very, very excited to continue to expand this partnership under your leadership. As many of you know, The Sentinel is our flagship publication. With Professor Gnor's vision and Mr. Stevie Weinberg's patience, uh, we now routinely feature an ICT article in The Sentinel and are happy to share that in honor of today's conference, we did an early release of the fourth article in this partnership titled, In Word and Deed, Global Jihad and the Threats to Israel and the Jewish Community by ICT's very own Lorena Atia Slavosky, Itan Azani, Michael Barak, and CTC's longtime colleague, fellow and friend, Asaf Mogadam. I encourage you to read their analysis on jihad rhetoric and attacks against Israel and the global Jewish community. While I won't spoil the whole story, you should know that a combination of Israeli diplomacy and Israeli military strength serve as a powerful shield to a persistent threat. If you don't currently read The Sentinel, I encourage you to not only subscribe to our free journal, but contribute to it. Our editorial team of Paul Krushank and Christina Hummel do tremendous work delivering cutting edge analysis from this global community of scholars policymakers, and practitioners each and every month. And your insight will only make that product better. The Combating Terrorism Center at West Point strives to serve in a way modeled by ICT. We were founded only a few years after. We want to be a place where partnerships grow, where ideas are shared, and where together we can reduce the real and present threats posed by violent extremist organizations. So for these remarks, I thought about sharing some recent, recent scholarship from our talented team at CTC, or perhaps providing some insight on the threat landscape. And to be perfectly honest, uh, I originally planned to talk about the evolution and future of definitions of terrorism. That is, until I saw I was going to be followed by Professor Alex Schmid. I may not be a smart man, but I'm smart enough to know that me trying to talk about definitions of terrorism on the same stage as Dr. Schmidt would be like a young Luke Skywalker explaining the Jedi Force to Master Yoda. Instead, on this afternoon, on the last day of the conference, I want to offer something to think about. A small framework that we believe is essential for the future of our field. Driving on Highway 20 from Ben Gurion Airport to Tel Aviv, you'll notice a bright yellow building in its quote from Albert Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. The rest of this quote, which does not fit on the building, is that imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress and giving birth to evolution. Talking about imagination on September 12th is appropriate. Everyone here is familiar with the, with the conclusions of the United States 9-11 Commission report that a major contributing factor to that tragedy was a failure of imagination. A failure of imagination. So what does that mean? And how do we ensure that we don't commit that same failure again? First, we should acknowledge that a failure of imagination is a natural product for all of us in the face of a persistent threat. 
Our policymakers and practitioners rarely have the space to look beyond analyzing the knowledge we have and making their recommendations to disrupt the closest and most imminent threats. As scholars, we respond to this phenomena by researching topics that have an immediate, tangible effect. It can be difficult to receive the support and funding to pursue and study events with remote possibilities. To conduct research that deals with hypotheticals may not even have a ready audience. Although those in the immediate intelligence and security fight might have an interest in those possibilities, I assure you it's rare for them to have the resources to spend on something that is not probable. Every dollar, every analyst allocated to obscure possibilities is a dollar or an analyst not evaluating the most clear and present dangers. To simplify this dilemma into basic economics, it's a supply and demand problem. And the demand is justifiably for work and knowledge on what known threat groups are doing now and what our data and evidence tell us they might do in the future. So how do we address this? In 2014, after reading the fictional work World War Z, the United States Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, went to the Pentagon and asked his admirals and generals, what would we actually do if we faced zombies? And now while we all know General Dempsey certainly did not believe that zombies may be our next national security challenge, these are actually the kind of questions we might want to explore in our field. Why? Because taking a very small amount of time to think about the impossible makes us more comfortable dealing with the far boundaries of what actually is possible. Those unlikely scenarios expand our imagination of what might occur, but even more importantly, these scenarios help us find gaps in our responses and in our preparedness. It's worth remembering that in the months leading up to 2001, NORAD suggested injecting an exercise that examined how we would respond to a hijacked commercial airline crashing into the Pentagon. The plan was dismissed as remote, and instead that exercise was reallocated towards dealing with the threats posed by North Korea. Similarly, Richard Clark had originally imagined the possibility of aircraft crashing into venues at the Olympics in 1996, and he talked about this in a memo to Secretary Rice in early 2001. He asked her, imagine the morning after, with hundreds dead. It wasn't really an absence of imagination, but instead, the scope and scale of our imagination was not large enough. So what are the practical ways that we can address this? Especially as resources for our field become more and more limited. I offer three suggestions. Leadership, time, and asking bigger and more uncomfortable questions. First, it requires that leaders like you make it a priority. You in this room have the ability to challenge your teams to give even a small amount of focus to this endeavor. It's vital that ideas that even sound foolish are considered. Remember that we're asking people, analysts, scholars, who pride themselves on being correct to operate in an area where they will most likely be wrong. Coming up with ideas about threats in groups that might never materialize, thankfully. But a professor once told me that a hypothesis proven wrong is still an important and valid study as it contributes to our expanding knowledge. The second answer to this is time. What if only once a month we took just one hour to think about things beyond the realm of the present and the possible, to let our imaginations go to places that seem both uncomfortable and highly unlikely? I encourage directors and managers to build in even the smallest amount of time to this exercise for your teams as well. Once a quarter, or even just twice a year, a short meeting, even a lunch, bring the team together and challenge each other to consider threats that may even be stranger than fiction. The third challenge is to be bold. And this may sound dark, but imagine not 100, as Mr. Clark proposed, but 10,000 casualties in a single event. How could that even happen? Where could it happen? Who has the power to make it happen? Even if they're not known adversaries, who could do it and with what weapons? Who can do that by generating infrastructure failures or through cyber means, through food supply disruptions? What what, I'm sorry, when tragedies unrelated to terrorism happen in the world, consider how the groups we study or groups yet unknown could manufacture similar outcomes. 
These natural tra disruptions and tragedies happen more often than we'd like. A ship stuck in the Suez, an energy meltdown in an unexpected Texas winter, a pandemic, a flood. Chaos is all around us. And if we are not imagining how our adversaries could replicate this at scale and in a very targeted manner, then they're already ahead of us and we're already behind. Last, consider the unlikeliest of allies. Work is expanding on ideologically agnostic terror. But what would happen if AQ and ISIS were to really truly unite? Very improbable, but what if? What if the violence we see on the African continent could become quickly and cheaply exportable at scale? What if lone wolves figured out a way to synchronize? A thousand on a day on a continent. As we leave here today, we have to commit to doing work with the knowledge that we have. That's our most important job. The threats that we face and the security we seek demands our attention to known evidence and real data. But if we want to be truly prepared and mentally agile, we have to exercise our imagination in our field. Even if the scenarios we create never come to fruition, the simple act of considering them enhances our preparation it exercises our mental agility, and when we suddenly face something we've never seen before, it doesn't feel so unfamiliar. So recently, a very senior United States Army general told our team at CTC, the United States may have changed its primary focus away from terrorism in our national security strategy, but I assure you that the violent extremist organizations have not changed theirs. The work that all of you in this room have done is tremendous and continues to keep our world safer than it is without you. Our founder at CTC said the CTC exists so that when others stop paying attention, we will not. That's where we are right now. In our country, our resources are understandably pivoting to larger threats to our national security. But we need scholars, practitioners, and policymakers to continue to keep their finger on the pulse of the terror threat. I mentioned the meaning of September 12th at the start of this talk when thinking about the need for a greater imagination. But my closing remarks are actually about why September 12th is such a meaningful symbol today. While these are polarizing times in global politics, it's helpful to remember that for a brief period after 9-11, people put aside differences locally, nationally, and internationally to come together, first to take care of each other but also to commit to a common goal to never let it happen again. Here in Israel, where the threat is visceral, it's an important day to recommit to all of our work and to recommit to each other, and I'm honored to do that with all of you today. Thank you.